okay. Um, so this is uh, what we have learned in the last two weeks. Um, so some of the common um, Python coding um, concepts will be tested uh, in midterm. For example, the eater, what's eater, what's next, uh, and what's try except. So for example, for example, uh, the midterm could perfectly ask us what's the input of, for example, what's the input of this, um, you know, something like that. Okay. So for example, um, what's the, in, uh, I mean, what's the output of this line? So if we put next eater uh, to an iterable object and what happens? Okay, so today we're trying to learn two things. The first one is how do we code for SGD? Um, the second one is uh, um, like uh, we want to have a light-hearted this type of a you know object-oriented programming of uh, um, that that's going to be used in uh, that's going to be used in um, the coding. So now uh, let's begin. By the way, um, I sent the chat if you want to run this notebook concurrently. Um, there is a link in the chat, which should be this. Okay. So if we can open it in Colab and to, uh, to run it at the same time. So first let's recap what's happening in stochastic gradient descent. And this is our loss function. So this is our F. The W represents our uh, neural network. And our loss function is element-wise loss. Um, even though I'm kind of abusing the notation a bit, you know, this F is the same thing as this F. So this F is really like an expression. Uh, like a, for a single element, for example, that is, uh, maybe I should name this uh, little l. So for example, it's either least square or cross entropy. So it's up to the application, whether we have a regression problem or a classification problem. So right now we have our classification problem. Uh, we just use uh, cross entropy for this one. And we have capital N that many samples. And of course we have, uh, um, we have this many uh, targets, you know, one sample corresponding to one target. If we write our SG algorithm like formally uh, in terms of uh, um, like an algorithm, okay, is we basically we do this. So what we have learned was the inner iteration so we can ignore this line first. How do we actually implement SGD is as follow. In the SGD, in the SGD, um, the, I mean, the of official SGD algorithm, it is we randomly choose a sample from our data. But actually that is, uh, I mean, so if every time we run a random number generator, we choose a sample from our pool, it's kind of inefficient. So an efficient algorithm is we shuffle. So with one shuffle, which only requires generation, the generation of one random number sequence. So that this reduces overhead by a, like a miles. So we randomly sh shuffle the sample so that it's like a permutation. For example, um, our third sample becomes the first sample of, and our first sample becomes like the fifth sample. I'm just making uh, an example, but uh, the key is we basically, we, um, we shuffle. Okay, so I think, uh, let me just, let me just add an I here, okay just to make uh, things better. So, and then at each iteration, so at each iteration is we compute the gradient for just one sample. 
if this is a gradient descent, it's an average of all the gradient right here. Okay. But for stochastic gradient descent, we only compute one sample. And this part consists of one epoch. So we say this is one epoch. So one epoch is we let the model see of all the samples in the data set once. So for example, if we don't permute the data set, then this is like uh, the first iteration is the data set see the first sample, and the second iteration is the data set see the second example, and it cetera. Now, once we conclude, um, you know, the, um, the example, um, like one epoch, we call this uh, an epoch, I'm sorry. We, we completed the sweeping, we call this an epoch. And what happens is this is our SGD. So it's like an actually implemented SGD is uh, we do permutation. So summary is permutation, compute the gradient descent, and uh, we sweep all the samples and this makes up epoch. And then we run the iterations for several epochs and we call it a day. So here is our remark. This is like a vanilla SGD is at each iteration, the gradient, the gradient is computed for a single sample. Um, I think I, I have this should be M, my bad. Okay. So the gradient is for a single sample. And, uh, um, and next is, this is what actually uh, in application um, more common. Let me share. So this is actually um, more common in practice. That is a mini batch SGD. The idea is very simple. The idea is instead of for a single sample, we let the model see a batch, all right? So we let the model see a batch and uh, this actually reduces the variance. So we, in the class, we proved that, that the convergence is within like a region with certain variance. Um, for, the, for the mini batch SGD, um, we can like reduces the variance, okay? So what happens is, um, the gradient is uh, computed for a mini batch. So for example, originally we have one sample here. So right now our mini batch, maybe say uh, 32, 20, 256 and et cetera. But we basically, we let our model see this many samples and we compute the gradient. So the algorithm is similar. I mean, if we formally write on the algorithm, it's like this. Um, but if we informally describe the algorithm, I mean, it's essentially just, uh, we replace this single um, gradient evaluation by like the average of several grad gradient uh, evaluation. Um, so that's the mini batch SGD. If we write it formally, it's like this. First we have to, um, so I think this is B, my bad. So for example, first we have to, um, first we, uh, again, this is our initial guess and learning rate. So we have to choose another, this is called a hyperparameter. So we have to choose another hyperparameter the batch size B, for example, if we choose 32, then uh, our inner iteration will be determined by the flow of our total sample divided by this B. So basically we still let our model see all the samples, but now we let the model see the samples in a batch fashion. Like every time the model see 32 samples and we compute the average of the gradient um, of these samples. Same thing here. So number of epoch, um, this is just a formality. This is just a formality. Um, 
So for epoch equals zero and, uh, uh, and then we proceed, what happens is we basically, we set the initial guess of uh, each epoch to be the last output of previous epoch. So again, we randomly shuffle all the samples, but now here, So I think I use this F, but it, it doesn't, I mean, you guys will know, but this is uh, like the loss function for the sample B times F plus I, okay. Um, so I think, I, I, think I, I have to use batch size is B, right? So uh, this is B, this is B. Um, is it? Yeah, it's B. So basically we have, all, this is batch size and this is batch size. So uh, essentially we have, this is one. So alpha times one times sum of with respect to this B, but divided by the batch size. So it's like average gradient within the batch. And this is currently the current de facto, like a training method for every deep learning out. That is uh, we use a mini batch. And like I said, um, the good thing about this is uh, re reduces variance and um, it's more efficient. Like I said here, less overhead. For example, if we want to evaluate the gradient, we have to invoke the torch backward, this backward autograd uh, mechanism, and that has certain overhead. But if we have a batch because our code is already vectorized using the torch interface, so uh, it's going to be faster per sample. So that's why we use, uh, uh, from a software engineering point of view, uh, the computation time, the computational cost is lessened. Wow. And now, okay. Um, so now let's proceed to implement uh, this mini batch SGD. So again, we import every package. So like I said here, um, so I upload the MNIST file to my own website and we only have to run this uh, cell of code uh, and basically we'll download it and it will be, so for example, it will be here and we can actually view it. We can actually view it right here in the files of, uh, so of our, this interface of Colab. So this is a processed file, but uh, we'll use the unprocessed file to uh, like to load things. And then if we do this, so if in, so if in, this is our root folder. So if we click this folder icon, this is in the root folder and the root folder is the current folder. This is a Linux like uh, syntax of uh, getting the current folder. So basically we're saying, okay, so our data set is located as a current folder. And then we, if we load it, so we're good. So we're getting the same trend. So for example, train size. Okay, my bad. So for example, now we have 60,000, uh, but this is still um, the train yet. So for example, if we, uh, I think we have, so, so for example, we can say uh, we print, I think we still have data. So uh, size, so data has size. Okay, good, train label. Um, why you wanna do that? Labels, I think it's either targets. Okay. So now this is our data. We have 60,000 images. Each image is a 28 by 28 matrix. And then we have a 60,000 um, array. So for example, uh, if we add on top, if we just uh, see the first 20, so we'll get um, you know the number of classes. So how do we convert this into a mini batch is we just use this, what is called the data loader. So the data loader, 
is the PyTorch's interface to generate the mini batches. We saw it here. We don't have to manually indexing. Okay, so that that that's a key. That is, um, let me let me move let me make my mouse cursor bigger. Um, okay, better. So. What happens is we have lots of ind indices here, right? B times M, so batch size times current, this iteration plus, you know, this I, okay? And then we have this batch size, we have to iterate this. The torch data loader, this function, so does it all for us, and let's see why. So now let's, uh, let's run this line of code. Now it becomes a torch data loader object. And what happens is we can use, um, we can use our sample to view it. So for example, we do sample equals. So now we use what we have learned in Python is this is a nice, like this is a, a nice debugging, uh, exp uh, like a debugging technique. So when we load so most of the time for actual application, we have to write our own data set. So it's not prepared, the data is not prepared. In actual practice, for example, in an interview, um, we may be asked, okay, so given you this, uh, you know, a CSV, how do we process it? And so after we write on our data set, we feed into a data loader, how do we debug it is we use this next. So we run this line of code just to make sure the train loader, the data loader object here can yield a correct sample, all right? So let's read it. So right now uh, the sample is here and now let's print um, what sample. So for example, first let's look at the sample. So first of all, it's a list, okay? So then we say, oh, it's a list then uh, then we for um, i in range len sample, we print sample i size. So as we can see here, um, yeah, because it's, um, okay, so yeah, this is uh, interesting. I don't, I'm not sure if uh, the data loader has a channel. So let me just, uh, Okay, sampler is that. So batch size shuffle, collate function, pin memory. Okay, generator is none, but uh, yeah. let me just still use this. So as we can see, the first one is an image, the second one is a label. So for example, uh, if the shuffle is false, we should get a five as our first, yeah, we should get five as our first label. So for example, is because the train has five as its first target. So they're like the data are ordered and we just honor this order. Okay. And we have a 28 by 28 matrix. Uh, why we have an extra one here is because this has the torch data loader automatically treats the image as the RGB three channels. And here we have a grayscale channel. So it has only one color channel and this is a batch size. Okay, this is a batch size. So now let's let us uh, to verify how the batch size changes if we change the parameter of this data loader. So for example, we change the batch size to, to eight, okay? We run this again and we do, uh, we run this uh, next. So the sample, so now we change the batch size to eight. Our sample should have eight samples in it. So it's a still a list, but if now we print the size of the tensor in each entry of this list, we will have this eight in front. Like I said, this one is just extra. It's the color channel. So it's the eight, eight and 28 by 28 really works here. So now if we print the, uh, if we print the label, which is one, so we'll have five, zero, four, one, 
9213, which is like the first eight entries here. Why it has only seven entries? Oh, eight, sorry. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. So that's, uh, that's how we, you know, generate, that's how we generate the data for our SGD. So now let me just quickly pause here to make sure, um, you know, like uh, everyone is following me on that one. Um, cool. So I see a majority of you guys are okay. So I'll move on. Okay. To prepare the training. So now we have our data loader now, uh, which will generate um, the data for us. The next is we come up with a network. So keep in mind today, uh, in today's presentation, uh, we'll, we'll train our model. We'll train our model uh, on the general on the general MNIST data set. That means we have uh, we have ten classes here. Okay. So for example, this is the code of last time. This is um, this is how we use the um, the NN sequential um, like module to combine the linear layer, which is uh, the layer we learned in class, and activation function linear layer, and that. So right now here I'm given a simple class implementation. So uh, sorry, I copy paste and forgot to delete this. So, and let me uh, zoom out the code a little bit. So for example, I think for example, this one will be that. Okay, good. So right now uh, we can implement, we can implement our um, using a class. So I'll explain each component of the class. So first one, this MLP is class name. So our, so let me use this. So name of the class. And why we have a bracket here. Okay, so, um, so why we have a bracket here is because um, MLP is a subclass of uh, this NM module. So it's an M module is also a class. So it's a subclass of that. And what is a subclass mean is like uh, if we go to look at the NM modules, you know, um, I think we, we cannot view the source code right now, but uh, the NN module has, uh, has lots of things. So we can think a class uh, essentially. So how do we visualize the class in the Python is we literally, we treat it like a class. So for example, uh, for example, in, in the class, think of our class, um, for example, we have uh, we have homework, uh, we have assignment, and we have some common pipeline of doing things. For example, submitting homework, and we can all treat those as the object within this class. And then, uh, for example, the subclass is like a we go to Canvas and we go on the People's tab. We create a like a, a final project group. This group shares the resources from like our class, but it has own it, its own little space. So that's a subclass. And how do we invoke this class inheritance is using the super command here. So we have to put this super here. So this keyword makes the MLP, okay, to inherit everything from this. So, and this super is called a constructor. So, I think uh, VS Code already has an explanation here. 
uh, does it have um, its constructor? All right, so class method. Maybe this is too, too difficult for us. Um, the bound object. Okay, so we haven't learned the bound super object. So I don't plan to go through it, um, but it's, but we have, if we wanna use, you know, the bound method, we have to introduce instance and I don't wanna do that. So let's just focus more on math instead of a software engineering. And next is the self. Okay, self is literally the self. So self is referring uh, to the class itself. And then this is initialization. So, so after, this function, is initialization. And in, 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 uh, in, in Python, we'll see lots of these, uh, you know, double underscore and what does that mean? So, um, so for example, what happens is we can, we can have this. So for example, our name is main and we can have, uh, the, for example, a, a length of a list, so two, zero, sorry. So for example, this list has length three. If we have a double underscore, so for example, we have our sample, right? Whoops. So if we invoke the DIR algorithm, this, this returns all the possible method associated with this object. And we'll see lots of a double underscore here. This means uh, these are the Python built-in method for this object. So this is, uh, this is the Python's way of differentiate the built-in function and something like uh, you can apply. So even though this is the built-in function as well, but this is like, a, these are universal function method for every type of variable um, in Python. So for example, the, the best example of demonstrate this is for example, the add. Um, we can add two arrays, right? Um, but meanwhile, we can add a two tensor, okay. So this add is for two arrays. And meanwhile, we can add two tensors, sorry. From software engineering, From software engineering point of view, this ad is totally different from this ad. It's just a happen that the definition of this ad function, so it's just the definition of the ad function for the NumPy array behaves the same way with Torch Tensor. So, um, but from a software engineering point of view. So if we take like a um, object oriented programming 101, especially in Java, you know, so if we take any Java class, your instructor will tell you, oh, you know, this ad is different from this ad. Or sometimes for some variable, this ad is not even defined. Okay. So, um, so for example, this ad for the tensor uh, behave like this, and this ad may behave differently for, um, for different variables. So for example, if we have a list, okay. What does this add do is add now is different for list. As we can see for list, so the add is actually concatenated them. So, okay. So the same thing, the same thing for uh, the same thing for um, 
The same thing for uh, string. So for example, if we have string is math 450 plus sucks, you know. What's happened if we run this? Oh, so we add a space here. Okay. So we'll get this, you know. So what happens is my point is the add is working differently for different objects. And what we're doing here, this initialize, this init function is we initialize this object. So every object can have different initialization. So here we directly copy down uh, the layers. What we can do is we don't even, we don't even have to follow this implementation. What we can do is, for example, we can do the first linear layer is n n linear. Uh, maybe so. Seven eighty four two fifty eight, and the first activation is activation zero is uh, n n relu. You know, we don't have to necessarily use relu. And for example, we self next the linear layer is the let, let's just have two linear layer. Okay, so I'm kind of lazy. Don't want to type all of it. So uh, linear, uh, we may have 256 and 10, and then we're good. And uh, uh, we can comment this, okay. So we may have even to have a better uh, activation function, it's called leaky relu. So let's try that. And then the forward method, okay. So the forward is a built-in method. So forward um, function is a built-in method Method just means function, okay, for a uh, module. And we always put self here because uh, this is uh, like a method associated with this class. So this was our original implementation. So let, let's comment out this. Oh, we still need the first line because our, because our, um, our sample are in this size. Okay, so we have to reshape it into, um, so this is, uh, so this is resize each batch into, what happens is batch size. Okay, so this is batch size and then uh, 28 times 28. This, this is essentially does this thing. That is we fix the batch size and then we just combine all the rest like the entries. So this is done also done automatic. The other way is, uh, the other way is less automatic is we can also do this. Okay, so uh, like, like, like we said in the midterm review, uh, we have multiple ways to doing this. We can also do this, okay. Um, I mean, for this specific, for this specific data set, these two achieves the same effect, but this one, so I'm gonna comment out on this. This is less, like uh, less general, more bug pro. Okay. So this this is a standard code in uh, in PyTorch. If we want to make it more bug, like a not bug prone, we have to add a contiguous here. But uh, I'm gonna skip that. Okay. So contiguous just means copy, but I'm not gonna do that here. And then we just feed this x, okay? So we say x1, x0, let's do x1. And then self linear zero of x, okay? So this is like our input. We let the x go into our first linear layer. And then um, we do it uh, um, in our, then we let it go through an activation. So let's do a1 equals self acti x1, okay. We let it go through an activation, which is right here. And then uh, we, uh, now we have our output, which is uh, uh, self linear one, a1, okay. And then we return the output. So this is this this method right here is like a forward pass. Let's uh, let's run this uh, self code, 
and um, I'll skip that. Okay, so let's um, because we have to we we will learn optimizer class uh, next class. So let's uh, postpone this uh, example of class. Um, so we'll we'll learn more detail about how do we write a class next class. Okay, sounds a little bit rhetoric, but uh, um, but we'll we'll learn how to write class uh, or classes. So now let's initialize the model. We don't put any uh, parentheses here because we don't have any parentheses, like any input here. So let's run, uh, let's run this code. And the model is like initialized. So for example, we can, we can print the model and it's essentially this, okay? Now, if we add an initialization, so for example, we can normally, this is uh, the practice that is the input size. So we can do input size equals 784. This is like the default input size, which fits our MNIST data set. Oh, let, let me not do this. Let me just do this. Okay. So now let's run it. And if we run this again, so we'll see an error and let's read what the error is going to be. Okay. So here. So it says initialization missing one required positional argument emphasize is because we, 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 we wrote the model that we need an input size um, here, okay? And, but uh, we don't have any input size here. So, and our input size should be an integer. So for example, and we can require our input size to be an integer in this way. So let me add this comment on top. And uh, this uh, uh, comma integer requires input size to be an integer, okay? So, and this 784 should actually then be input size. So let's run it and let's try to initialize it again with 784, so then we're good. So as we can see, and then if we print the model, we get the same thing. Now, because we require the number of the input, like the size of the integer ha has to be an integer. If we put, let, let's try to put 784.1, okay. Let's read the error message here. New, the argument size must be tuple of integers, but found element type flow at position two. Okay, so for example, so here it asks us, this has to be an integer, but uh, this is a float, okay. So I think leaky relu can have like an input, right? So it's a negative slope, so we can have a negative slope equals, uh, let's do slope. And we add the slope here, okay. So slope equals 0 0.2 and float. So this is saying we have another input slope that is 0 0.2 and it has to be float and uh, um, which is used here. Okay, so let's run it again. Oh, my bad, sorry. So it has to be this equals 0 0.2. Okay, and now let's run it. So we can do the input size equals 784 and our slope equals 0 0.01. So uh, this is how we initialize a class. And we print our model. So it's gonna be, if we, we can do this. And now the slope is gonna be like, uh, this is how we pass variable um, inside. So for example, we can change our input, okay, 500. So then we have, this is 500, but we, we need 784, I mean. Uh, so this is our model. And next is, uh, what happens here? Uh, did I, did I miss the indent? Okay. But right now this is the template for the training. 
So let me uh, make it smaller um, for you guys to view. Okay. Yeah, still bigger. Okay. So first we, uh, we, have, we have prepared our train loader, which fits our model like the batch. Um, and then we initialize our model. The next is the loss function. So we define here. We actually, like, uh, like we said earlier, so Torch has many built-in functions, but still, if we want to write our own machine learning model for some specific problem, most of the time, for example, I'm writing custom loss function for my research all the time. And we have to implement the loss function in a very vectorized way um, for PyTorch. And we run like maybe two epoch. Okay, learning rate is that. So somehow I, I, I'm not sure what's wrong with it here. Okay. Let, let me first comment out this. Let, let's first just do one epoch. Okay. So I think it's about the indent. The, so it, it tells us wrong. So in, in the last few minutes, I want to introduce a nice progress bar app. It's called TQDM, okay? So import TQDM auto. Uh, so from import TQDM. Okay. So it's a progress bar. If we put um, the TQDM in front of an iterator, it automatically generates a, a progress bar for us. Let's try to see it. So now let's run this code and then we'll explain what happens. Not defined, my bad. Okay. All right. Um, bool object has no float. I think this has uh, has something to do with uh, um, our um, our that. Let me just quickly debug it. One eight. Okay. So um, gray shape minus one. Gray shape minus one. How about I'll put all. Oh, I'll put all is that my bad. So I have to use argmax. Okay. So I'll put all equals I'll put all argmax axis equals minus one. List object has no argmax. Yeah. NumPy array has no float because they're all NumPy array, so it's that. And the array object has no append target or. Um, oh, why? It has append, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. So, okay, there we go, finally. Oh, as we can see here, we have a nice progress bar. Okay, so sorry for the quick debugging. So some of you guys might miss the detail, but uh, um, I will add comment in the published notebook uh, later, you know, like, um, so for example, after two epoch, our accuracy is uh, 32%. And uh, so it will increase by more epoch, okay. Um, so that's it for today, um, essentially, I mean, we still have to go through the code uh, by ourselves. So for example, the output loss function and what this does and zero grad, auto grad, and this is our gradient descent. Um, so next time we'll first explain like uh, this chunk of code in more detail. And then uh, we'll learn uh, how do we implement like uh, more about the class. So that's it for today. I'll stop recording. And if you have some short question, you're welcome to stay here and ask.